Local Matters family, we have a treat today in the form of Jared T. Williams. He is our district attorney on the Augusta Judicial Circuit, which encompasses Richmond and Burke counties. Um, before we get started into some of the uh, real deep issues surrounding crime on this judicial circuit, uh, I want to point out a, a, a little known fact about Jared and myself and the connection between us. In fact, it's so little known that I don't think Jared knew about it. <laughs> but uh, Jared's grandfather, J.C. Williams, and my father, Callaway Allen, were close friends many decades ago. So our families go back and have a long history and I'm very pleased to see that the grandson of J.C. Williams is playing such an important role in our community. Thanks for being on, on local matters <laughs> today. Well, thank you for having me. Do you know what the C stands for in JC? I do not. I don't know what the J stands for, to be honest. It's James Calloway. So I didn't realize that they had the same name, too. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that all these years. I did not know that. And I yeah. wonder if my father even knew, um, because I, I think uh, the origin of the relationship, did he work at Savannah Riverside by any chance? He did. He did. Okay. He worked security. Okay. When, my father When he wasn't was working on cars. Right. And see, that's the connection I'm familiar with is the cars. Uh, my father worked at Savannah Riverside from 1954 until he retired in 1986. Wow. And uh, J.C. would work on our cars and my father would come paint his house. Oh, that was yeah. their trade off. So, because uh, yeah, my father worked full time at Savannah Riverside, and then his part time job was doing some house painting. So, uh, so yeah, I practically grew up in that house off of Wooten Road. So, yeah, that I is am. exactly it. So, yeah, you saw some of my father's handiwork when you were over there. <laughs> All right, so glad again to have you here. I want to, as always, help our listeners and now our viewers. Uh, just understand what local and state governments do for them. And a key role there is the role of the district attorney. Um, I always also like for our guests to explain a little bit about the arc of their careers so that people understand how they got to where they are. So if you could just kind of talk about how you prepare to be district attorney of the Augusta Judicial Circuit. Sure. Well, as everyone's already learned by now, I'm from Augusta, born and raised. Um, my, my dad's from Augusta, my mom's from Thompson, so we're a pretty local family. Um, and I, I grew up here, I went off to school, I came back and, um, well, I really came back as an intern for the DA's office. I, I didn't know what I wanted to do legally, um, but I got an internship at the DA's office. And during that summer, you know, I was, um, I was working and I was coming into court and I was getting to see cases and I got to watch a trial. It was a five day trial of a guy who had come from Atlanta. Uh, he was actually dodging his probation officer in Atlanta. He comes down here and just sets the city on fire. He's doing armed robbery after armed robbery and it culminates in a murder. And so we had this five day trial and I'm watching it and I'm just enraptured. And I knew from that moment on, um, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a, a, a trial attorney. And particularly, I wanted to be a prosecutor. And you know, I went to law school down in Florida. I, I had the bright idea that if I was going to put myself through law school, I should do it on the beach, um, which was all great while I was there um, and a little less great now that I'm paying it back. Um, but I, I was trying to decide, should I stay in Florida? Should I stay in the city that I'm loving or should I go back home and serve? And I knew that because I wanted to be a prosecutor, there was nowhere else to serve but here in Augusta. Um, and so I did that for several years. I used to get to the courthouse at 830. I'd work all day. I'd, uh, at five o'clock, I rush out of here, I'd take off my suit, I put on an apron and I go wait tables. Um, so it, it made for some, some long time, some long evenings. Um, but eventually I decided that I had another passion, which was language. And I wanted to uh, learn how to speak Spanish. And so I moved from the, the States. I moved out to Spain. I, I lived there as a teacher for two years. Um, I came back, opened a defense practice, had my own practice for about 12 minutes. And then a local firm snatched me up and, and I, I said, you know what, y'all's phone rings more than mine. So let me go do that. Um, and then it, throughout the course of, of my time 
both as a prosecutor and then as a defense attorney, there were some things about the criminal justice system that didn't sit right with me. There were some some limitations to the system um, that didn't sit right to me. And then there were some some attitudes and some processes that I thought were damaging um, to certain communities. And so um, I prayed about it. I labored over it. But eventually I decided to run for office, I run for the district attorney's office. Um, I ran in 2020. Everything was going great. I'm raising money. I'm having events, have a great big fish fry. And then the world ends in March and <laughs> everyone's locked in their house. Uh, so I um, had an interesting COVID campaign, um, but we did emerge victorious. I won in November of 2020 and I took office in January of last year. All right, very good. And as you talk about that, that's your particular path to the district attorney's office. Um, in terms of what the law requires to, to meet the minimum qualifications to run for DA, are there any qualifications? Well, you have to be a barred attorney. You have to have lived in the circuit for three years preceding. Um, and I want to say you have to have practiced for five years, but I, I'm not certain on that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Whatever the qualifications were, I met them. So you met them. I didn't have to All worry right. about them too much. And no age requirements on that, right? Because no, I was like, actually... there's an age requirement. Yeah. Well, so I am the youngest DA in the state of Georgia as it stands currently. Um, but what at least I was when I started. Now I think I age about 10 years a day. So <laughs> I think I'm the oldest. <laughs> <laughs> which which is the perfect segue into the next thing that I had planned to ask you. Um, you were you wanted this office because there were some changes that you wanted to make. You were successful in earning the office. And now uh, you're there. And I think we would all just want to know, it would help us understand what exactly does a district attorney do all day? Sure. So the DA is the chief law enforcement officer for the circuit. Our circuit comprises Richmond and Burke counties. And what that means is law enforcement goes in and makes investigations, um, makes arrests, and then they send their file, their warrants, everything they have on the case to us. And we make a determination. Well, really, we make two uh, initial determinations. The first is, did law enforcement follow the law themselves? Uh, we can't live in a society that works for the people if we're not making sure that the people who are in charge of enforcing the law follow the law. Secondly, we look at, is there a reasonable basis to believe that the person accused of the crime actually did it? That's what a lot of people refer to as probable cause. After making that determination, if, if we find that, that one, the law has been followed, and two, that we think we have the right person, there's probable cause that we have the right person, then the prosecutor, the DA, has a world of discretion as to what happens next. We decide whether to ask a judge to hold someone in jail pending trial or to grant them a bond. We decide whether to file formal charges like an indictment or an accusation, or um, if we want to dismiss the charges. We decide if a case should be pled out and make a recommendation to the judge, or do we want to push a case to trial? Um, all of those are determinations that are made day in and day out. And the idea is this, those decisions have to be made with an idea of not just what happened in this case, but what's best for public safety overall. Um, and so as DA, I set a number of community safety priorities, things that I felt were the most important objectives that we had to, to work on. Um, and I, there's no secret to it. My main concerns are violent crime, and crimes against women and children. And so um, we, we set out the priorities and we set about creating an office and an office culture that focuses on ensuring that we are appropriately tough where it's necessary, but also understanding that we need a system that not just punishes people and not just holds people back, but actually propels them forward. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask you something I didn't plan to ask, but when you talked about crimes uh, against women and children that hit home with me, um, I remember a case long ago, uh, many years ago, I was living in another city at the time, where there were a couple of young girls, and when I say young girls, 12, 13 years old, who accused 
um, an adult male of molestation, an adult male in a position of authority of molestation. Those girls went to court, uh, told their stories, and the defense attorney, who was by all accounts extremely well skilled, uh, was successful in getting the male in a position of authority off scot-free, never served, served a day in jail. That had an impact on me because I saw, well, if these young girls can come forward and have the courage to say what they said, and then basically they were not believed at all, does that place a chilling effect on the next young girl who has who feels she's been victimized? And does that mean that she's just gonna keep quiet because she doesn't believe anything's gonna happen? It absolutely has a chilling effect. And now I wanna be clear, the system is meant to work um, so that the innocent person does not get his liberty taken. So I'm never going to question a jury's decision-making. Um, but here's the issue. We know that women and children oftentimes do not disclose the things that happen to them. Um, and, and, I mean, and if you think about it practically, if someone asked me to tell a room of strangers about my last sexual experience, I wouldn't want to do it. And it was consensual. <laughs> so imagine the worst event that ever took place in your life, a, a molestation or, or an assault on your bodily autonomy. And you are asked to tell an investigator, you're asked to tell a nurse, um, a, a forensic interviewer, a judge, a prosecutor, 12 strangers in a jury box, all of them, and it's on the record. Um, of course, there's a chilling effect. Of course, people don't opt to be in that position. Um, and so we have to be careful with the way that we prosecute these cases. Um, oftentimes we have to make determinations on will a trial of this case create a further re-traumatization of our victim? Is there a way to resolve this case that spares the victim from having to come into court? Um, and so every time that we have a jury find not guilty on a case like that, it's difficult because it does have that chilling effect and because that young lady or that child does not feel as though they were believed and that makes them less likely to come forward. But it also makes other people in the community less likely to come forward. Um, and, and that's a shame. I think the process itself is just really tough. Um, and so that, re that results in so many people keeping things to themselves. And as you speak of ways to, to handle those cases, might that then be a case in order to prevent the victim, who may be a, a child, from having to tell the story over and over again, to experience that trauma over and over again? Is that a case sometimes you might ask for a plea deal on in order to prevent that person from having to come into court? And how do you decide if that's what you're going to do? I'll tell you exactly how we decide. So we do an evaluation, not just of the evidence, but of the impact on the victim. Um, because at the end of the day, we serve, it's funny because my, uh, my division chief of special victims just walked past. Uh, so, um, well, let me just kind of start there. So we created a unit, a special victims unit, where we have prosecutors who are dedicated solely to sex crimes, crimes against women and children, and crimes against the vulnerable and the elderly. Um, and that allows for a certain level of specialization where our prosecutors are at, operating at the highest level. Um, it also means that there's more chance for collaboration between the sheriff's office and our other investigating agencies and the prosecutors who'll be handling the case. It means that our victim advocates and our prosecutors are in the best position to help victims because they specialize in those matters. Um, and when we're making the determination on should this case go to trial or should it be resolved, that's a question on the evidence, the likelihood of success at trial, um, and whether we can actually meet the ends of justice without re-traumatizing our victim. There are some times when we can't. It sometimes it's not an option. I cannot get a sentence that protects the community unless I bring this child into court to testify against them. And that's unfortunate. 
Um, but we're always going to choose public safety. Um, but with that, if we can spare our victims, we try to. Okay. Thank you for that, that explanation. Um, and do you actually go into court? Do you prosecute cases yourself or do you leave that to your, your uh, team of attorneys in your office? Ask me what I did this morning. <laughs> so <laughs> this morning I this started morning, off, Jared Williams. <laughs> this morning I started off the day with a bond hearing. So um, on Friday mornings, anyone who's in jail who has not had their case heard by a judge um, has the opportunity to ask for a bond. Uh, and I've handled one of those myself. Now I usually jump in when I need to jump in and not necessarily um, when it's when my coming in might be a hindrance to the teams that are working and, and dedicated to the cases on, on that caseload. Um, so to answer your question, yes, I do. I, I try to make it to court as often as possible. Um, unfortunately, the administration part of the job keeps me out of the courtroom more than I would like. And exactly. And I'm familiar with that administrative burden because you're, you're essentially a supervisory attorney. Um, but I would think you have to pick and choose at those particular times, you know, what case is so important that you feel like you have to appear yourself? Yeah, well, I mean, we had a, an eight-year-old little girl lose her life to gang violence this year. And so every time that one of those defendants comes up for court, I show up myself. Okay, all right, great. Thank you so much. And as you talk about the role, you know, something that you really, really wanted to do, um, have there been any big surprises since you've been in office? Big surprise. Uh, I mean, I, uh, I ran a three county race for a three county circuit and halfway through my tenure, it became a two county circuit. So that was a bit of a surprise um, in one way. Um, another surprise, I, I guess, would be um, I didn't realize. Well, let me back up a second. When you're trying a case, there's nothing else that you're focused on but that case. You know, the, you're you're in the room and every little thing matters. So you're just mentally on a, to the nth degree. And there's a level of stress that comes with trying cases that um, you kind of get used to as you're trying your own case, but you don't feel that when someone else is trying a case naturally, because it's not yours. I did not expect how much of the stress and the pressure I feel every time an attorney's in court trying a case, even if it's not mine, because essentially they are all mine. Um, and so I just, I've never had that shared, you know, someone else is trying a case and I feel like I'm in the chair with them um, un until I took this job. Okay. Yeah. And that's the burden of supervision. I mean, I have the same thing in organizations that I've run. I'm sitting there biting my <laughs> fingernails going, I sure hope she gets that right because <laughs> yeah. you can help. But at a certain point, you know, they're on their own. But, but let me go back just a little bit, because I, I want to make sure I say this. While I do show up to court myself uh, and while I do take on some of the burden and the pressure, I could not do this job without the outstanding team that I have. I've been blessed to have such a great level of skill and talent, not just my attorneys, but my investigators, my legal assistants, my victim advocates. Everyone's working uh, toward a common goal. And there are days when I can't be here. Uh, and uh, I can't um, be orchestrating things and I don't have to worry about it. I can step away and know that the trains are going to run on time because we have good people. That's, and that's a great feeling to know that you have good people on staff. Brings a um, lot of peace. A lot of it. Um, as you were taking on this role, I was talking to a friend of mine. This goes back to when you were first sworn in. I was talking to a good friend of mine and we were just discussing some of the challenges that you would face uh, coming in. And my guess was that one of your biggest challenges would be assuring that the staff that you just discussed understood your philosophy of prosecution, because, you know, every prosecutor is going to come in with a different perspective. And my friend said that the biggest challenge you were going to have is associated with the complications of being an African-American prosecutor. Which one of us was right? Both of you. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, um, because there are real challenges to this, I, I find that being an African-American prosecutor and, and particularly the first uh, in our circuit 
um, is that it's a strength, not a weakness. It's a, it's a blessing and not a curse because it allows me uh, to lead an office that has a different perspective. Um, I have no problem saying that at, at one point during my campaign, there were no African-American attorneys uh, on the staff. So uh, by the time I got elected, there was one on staff. And then when I showed up, just, just me showing up, I doubled the diversity in, <laughs> in one fell swoop. Um, but more than that, I brought a staff with me um, of attorneys, not just diverse in their background or their ethnicity, um, but their, their, their actual perspective and life experience. You know, there are prosecutors who come from the same neighborhoods um, as uh, some of these raids happened in. And so that just creates a culture where we understand that we're dealing with human beings. We're not dealing with case files. Um, and so that culture piece and, and kind of the challenge of coming in and bringing a new prosecutorial philosophy, there's a lot of things that we agree on. I agree that if you're shooting people, uh, you need to get out of my community. I agree that if you mess with kids, you need to go to prison. Um, but what I don't agree on is sending people to prison for things that don't require that hefty of a punishment. And so if I can help a young kid keep a felony record um, from staining the rest of his life, I'm going to do it. Um, if there's uh, somebody who gets pulled over and has three grams of marijuana on him, um, I'm going to give him pretrial diversion because I don't want him to lose his scholarship to go to college. You know, that makes sense because at the end of the day, um, my whole goal is for public safety. And the more people who are disenfranchised and get branded with that scarlet letter F at an early age who aren't working, who aren't getting good jobs or going to schools, um, the more crime we have. And so we're trying to get to the same place. It's how we get there that, that is the challenge. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to um, be able to bring with me a, a level of experience and um, diversity of experience that helps inform the way that we prosecute cases. Excellent. And as you talk about crime, um, you know, crime nationwide has increased since the pandemic. Um, last week, week before last, I was just walking downtown because that's where I get my outdoor exercise and a reporter from WJBF stopped me and just said, you know, hey, you know, we got upcoming festivals and events coming. We've had a rise in crime, violent crime here downtown. Are you afraid to come to those special events because of the increase in violence? And my answer, of course, was no, because I, you know, I just realized it's life. Um, but I also wanted to point out that there needs to be more of a concerted effort to uh, address crime and the root causes of it in order for our community to be uh, safer overall. So from your perspective, somebody who sees it up close and personal on the daily, uh, what do you think would be the most effective steps that, that we can take to address the increase in crime rates? There are so many. <laughs> so uh, I'd, I'd start with this. One, yes, crime has risen across the U.S. And that is directly attributable to all the things that happened from 2020 on, and we're talking about a pandemic, we're talking about loss of wages, we're talking about increased time in the home, which means an uptick in domestic uh, instances. All of those things are baked into this cake, right? But the important thing to notice is this. One, um, crime has risen regardless of what jurisdiction you're in, whether you're in a blue jurisdiction or a red jurisdiction or a purple one, whatever it may be whether your DA is tough on crime or smart on crime, the same issues have, have arisen across the board. So we know that it's not tied to politics. What it is tied to is policy. And what we have to do is recognize that just because there is increasing crime does not mean that uh, we should go back to the same damaging policies that created the atmosphere in which that increase in crime could take place. Right. So it's not just a criminal justice problem. We have to make sure that we are providing opportunities across the board. Um, our jails and prisons should not be the primary housing facility 
for mental illness. Our jails and prisons should not be uh, the one way or the, the primary way that we handle the substance use disorder that so many people are affected by in our community. Um, because a health problem should not be a criminal problem until it becomes one. And we have to treat addiction. We have to treat mental illness. That's the health problems that they are. Um, or else we're just going to be kicking that can down the road. We need to find ways to engage our young people. We need to invest more heavily in our schools, particularly in schools that are underperforming. We need to invest in uh, community resources and activities and things that can keep our young people busy. There are basic life skills and uh, ways of, of living that are just completely alien to some of the folks in our community because they're never exposed to it. And so this is a community issue and it's gonna require a community response. Right. And um, I, I think uh, you're absolutely correct. Um, who though is it that has to take the leadership in pulling that community response together? Have, have we solved the mystery of uh, the chicken and the egg and who gets started? <laughs> I think that we all have to get started together. Um, and so responding to crime, my office, the sheriff's office, the FBI, DEA, ATF, we're all working together on the gang problem right now. We are actively working to make our community safer, right? But there are people in those communities who have other problems that exacerbate the issues of crime. And so when you've got a young person who is growing up in a home where um, there's not enough food to eat, or not enough um, energy for him to have a hot shower um, or, or an air conditioner, you know, that person is going to seek out ways to get out of that environment. And there are usually gang members around the corner who are willing to bring you in and show you the love and affection that you don't get while, while whatever mom's doing or whatever dad's doing um, and fill in that gap for you and expose you to money, allow you to make some money, um, which then, you know, th that desire for um, material things and that, that, that money becomes an addiction of an, in and of itself. And I, I was reading a case file where one of the, the members of this gang is, is so allegiant to the leader of the gang who's asking him to go commit murders <laughs> to, to go expose himself to life sentences. Why? Because ever since he's known him, he's never had uh, a, a day without a meal. He's never had an a, a day where he didn't have the opportunity to buy whatever he wanted. You know, that's what we're competing against. And so while we have a criminal justice response, we need socioeconomic responses as well. Going to shift gears a little bit and go to the topic of social media, something that has changed the, the landscape. Um, I, in pre preparation for this interview, I went through the Facebook page of, of uh, I think it's Jared Williams, district attorney, and I saw news releases about some of the prosecutions that you've been engaged in. I saw you participating in some community activities. Um, tell us why you thought it was so important for you to set up uh, such a page on social media and include that type of information? Well, I'm a big believer. And if you're going to be accountable to people, you have to be accessible to them. Um, and you can't say, hey, my doors are open, so come see me. That's not really access. Uh, you have to go to where people are. And most people I know are on social media. And so that's a reason um, why we keep up such a robust social media presence. Um, but then there's, a, there's another side to it too, because when I first came in, I wasn't doing press releases. I wasn't sending out stuff to the media. My understanding was that, uh, you know, if there was newsworthy stuff, a reporter would go investigate it and report it fairly. And when I found that that was not happening, when I found that, um, you know, if I wanted a conviction to get into the news, I had to send a press release. But if I had a dismissal, they'd just find that on their own. <laughs> you know, it, it became clear to me that I was not necessarily uh, being dealt with in, in, in good faith by everyone. So 
I decided we're going to put out the information for the people and they can decide as opposed to waiting on others to try and craft the narrative. Okay. All right. Very good. And it used to be the case, as you described that, you know, I started in local government service many years ago. Um, and back then, newspapers did have the resources. They had enough reporters that they could go carry, uh, go cover stuff. Um, they didn't always cover it in a way that I thought was accurate, but at least I knew it would get some coverage. Um, but that has changed so much because so few people are, are reading newspapers. They don't have the circulation. They don't have the advertisements that they used to have. And they cut their news staffs down that, yeah, now they aren't going to, to look for stuff. And that does create a, a need for a social media. And I'm glad you have it there. Um, and I'm sure you want to invite our, our listeners to go follow that page, right? Yes, please do. Please do. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. It's at Jared for DA, Jared Williams for district attorney. And we also have an office page, um, which uh, it's in its infancy. So you won't find as much there, perhaps. But Jared T. Williams, district attorney, Augusta Judicial Circuit. Um, you'll find all that on Facebook uh, and Instagram and Twitter. All right. Great. Great. All right. Um, also shifting gears again, because we got so much ground to cover with this interview. Um, one of the reasons that I created Local Matters is to help people understand how much of an impact that state and local governments have on their day to day quality of life. Um, they're really interested in going to vote for president because they see that's where they can have an impact. But the truth of the matter is, I think what happens at the state and local levels is just as or more important than what happens at the federal level. And one of the examples that I cite for that is the recent Roe versus Wade decision of the uh, Supreme Court. And even with that, which, you know, on the surface of it appears to be a federal issue, local prosecutors like yourself play a key role and you issued a statement about that recently. Uh, would you mind just sharing with our viewers the high points of that statement? Sure. I've made it clear that my singular focus is public safety. And when I am asked to do things that will impede my ability to protect public safety, um, I'm, I'm going to refuse. And so I've stated that the, the laws that are being proposed around abortion, where it would make it illegal for a woman or, or her doctor to consider saving that woman's life if she has a complication in her pregnancy or... Um, that would treat a victim of rape um, as a criminal in her own right if she were to, uh, to choose not to carry that rapist baby to term. Um, that's unacceptable to me. And I'm not going to use the resources of my office that I really need every single dime to combat people dying in the streets, to combat violent gangs, to combat um, people molesting children or, or uh, stealing someone's bodily autonomy, I'm not going to be a party to using those resources that are so valuable um, to prosecute women and their doctors for personal health care decisions. And so that, that's really um, the crux of it is I feel that it's damaging policy. I think that it would uh, ruin my credibility with my victims. It would ruin my ability to prosecute. Um, I'll give you an example of, if I have the time. Earlier this year, we prosecuted a rape case where a, a father, uh, over the period of years, drugged and raped his own daughter, and she became pregnant. Now, if she had chosen not to carry her rapist, incestuous father's child to term, some of these laws would ask me to prosecute her and, and allow the system to re-victimize her. How could I effectively prosecute the case against her father, her rapist, if she's afraid to talk to me? Um, and so when I say that this is all about public safety, um, I know that people have a lot of different opinions and firmly held beliefs on the issue of abortion. And I respect everyone's opinion, but I have to make decisions not based on public opinion, but public safety. And those concerns dictate that I will always put my resources toward uh, prosecuting the offenders, not the victims. 
And, and I noticed as I read that statement, which is on the Facebook page, that we just made reference to um, that there were uh, a group of attorney generals and district attorneys that had also signed a similar statement. Uh, are they a part of an organization that you're with or how did you all come together to do that? So I am part of an organization called Fair and Just Prosecution, um, and they authored the original statement and asked for sign. Uh, for signatories. However, um, not everyone who signed on is an actual member of the organization. Um, and I think at this point, we're over 100 DAs and attorneys general uh, and prosecuting attorneys from throughout the United States who have signed on. All right, excellent. And again, we're going to go back to the, the public because that's the reason that you are a public servant at this point. Are they, there are things that you wish the public knew about the Augusta District Attorney's Office that they don't know? I wish that everyone knew how hard people in this office are working every day to make sure that they are safe, to make sure that they are heard, uh, to make sure that we live in the type of society that we want to live in, where people are prosperous and safe, healthy, and working together. Um, I, I've alluded to my staff before, but I just cannot sing their praises enough because everything that they do day in and day out, some of these folks read about the most vile, disgusting crimes, like the one I just mentioned to you. You know, those are real human beings who are having to uh, make contact with that victim and help her through the process of, of the criminal justice system. Um, there are real prosecutors who are having to uh, look at the facts. Uh, match it with the law and bring it forth the charges, collect the witnesses. It's our investigators who go out in the street and try and find witnesses who don't want to talk to us uh, or don't want to come to court, don't want to be found. Um, it's our legal assistants who are making sure that every step that we take throughout the litigation of these years long cases gets properly documented so that we uh, can be effective. And so it, Everyone is working together and there's just so much effort put into the safety of this community. And I don't think that people often recognize the, the brains behind the operation is in uh, every single one of those people working every single day. And just pause there. How many staff people are in your office? Uh, right now we are at 53 and at full staff we'd be at 60. The great okay. resignation has hit us all. <laughs> yeah, hit us all. So, and tell me, is the, how many of those are attorneys and then how many are other support staff? Sure. So at full staff, we have about 60 individuals, about 30 of those would be attorneys and 30 would be victim advocates, legal assistants, and, uh, and investigators. Okay. So you're a good size law firm. We're the biggest law firm in the city, <laughs> All right. as we should be. All right, I got you. Um, other things, um, just as you look back on this term, because you're halfway, well, a year and a half into your first term, is that right? A year and a half. Okay. Yeah. Um, when this is over, four-year term, uh, when this first four-year term is over, um, please tell me what you want to be able to say about your service as the district attorney of the Augusta Judicial Circuit. At the end of this term, I would hope that the culture and the understanding about the DA's office would be that we gauge success, not by how many convictions we get, but by how many lives we change. And I would hope that there would be um, touch points throughout the community where people can talk about the way that the work we did changed lives, not just for the victims, but in many cases, for the defendants who need to turn their lives around so that they don't end up in a prison cell. I think the more that we can make someone's first time in the criminal justice system, their last time in the criminal justice system, the safer and better community that we have. All right, before we close out, is there anything else you wanna share with our listeners? Mm. Well, I just wanna say thank you for letting me come on. Um, I've been able to accomplish a lot in the first year and a half. Uh, we started a pretrial diversion program and that allows young people who come through the system not to be branded as felons. Um, we started the most aggressive 
um, stride toward combating violent crime and sex crimes in that we created a major crimes division with a dedicated violent crimes unit and a special victims unit. Um, we have set community safety priorities. Um, and we've dealt fairly with the community and made sure that everything that we put out there um, is honest work that will actually impact lives and make people safer. And so I'm just so thankful to have the opportunity to do this and to have the opportunity to share it with the people. Thank you so much for now being a part of the Local Matters family. <laughs> I came on once on, on the campaign trail too. So yeah, right. it's, uh, it's good right. to be on this side of things. <laughs> right. All right. Well, thank you so much.